Hi everyone, here's the book Chemist once again. Today I'm reviewing The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain, a novel that in its entirety I could only hear narrated and spoken in the voice of Nelson from The Simpsons spoof episode on Huckleberry Finn. When I was eight, one of my elementary school teachers, a great teacher and great person called Maristella, I still very often think about her, would read to us at the end of the day, uh, once a week I think, and I, I believe I can speak for the rest of my class when I say that it was one of our favorite moments in the entire week. She read us The Old Man and the Sea by Ernst Hemingway, and she read us The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, and we all loved Tom Sawyer. We loved Tom's irreverent uh, outlook on life. Life. We love to read about his adventures in this American, small American town where the wilderness just outside town looked like a place of endless mystery, endless fascination. It was just great fun and Huckleberry Finn was of course one of the most compelling characters in the adventures because of his status as one of the gang but also somehow separated from the rest of the kids by the fact that he was a bit wilder, he, he didn't have to be, uh, he didn't really have a family, he didn't have have to be to follow the rules of civilization and society his adventures really never had to end at all 20 years later i finally got round to reading the adventures of huckleberry finn himself a novel that by the way hemingway himself considered uh, one of the great masterpieces of American literature, a foundational uh, stepping stone in establishing American literature as a whole. And I, at first, I, I must say, in the first few chapters, it definitely feels like Akfin is a continuation of Tom Sawyer. You get that same sense of a childish wonder, that same sense of free and boundless play that you get in Tom Sawyer, except that the atmosphere and the tone of the novel shifts pretty quickly far away from that, especially as it becomes clear that Huck Finn himself, Huckleberry Finn himself, has become a bit fed up with the, the childishness and the pretense of all of these games with Tom and the rest of the gang. Uh, in his introduction, to the Penguin Classics uh, edition of the book, which I highly recommend. The introduction is beautiful and um, uh, gives you just the right amount of context to allow you to appreciate the novel in its entirety. Uh, by all means, only read it after you've read the actual thing, but do read it once you're done with it. It uh, includes a lot of suggestions for further critical reading. The, the end notes are, uh, are very informative. In the introduction, Peter Coveney, who edits the edition, he remarks on the fact that at one point uh, Mark Twain himself considered this novel to be just a sequel to Tom Sawyer and the first few chapters definitely start in that direction. The idea is that this is a continuation of those adventures but things change pretty fast and the event that shifts the narrative onto a different track is the arrival on the scene of Huckleberry's father. And please correct me if I'm wrong because it's been 20 years since I was read The Adventures of Tom Sawyer but I don't believe that any element in Tom Sawyer has the same fearsome, the, the, the same terrible and dreadful quality and the same element of danger that you get in uh, the scenes where Huck confronts his father. There is a very clear and present sense that Huck's father might actually hurt, if not kill, Huck just because he is a wicked and greedy old man. And it's impossible, really, for the novel to preserve that sense of childish, escapist wonder, this idea of just spending your days pretending, like going on adventures in your imagination, where you have to confront this kind of horrible and, 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 and present danger in your own home with the person who's supposed to be the closest to you. Huck's father is an emblematic character in the novel at large because for all that he is a hundred percent well, a monster, he is also somewhat hilarious. There's, um, uh, there's a scene that's just laugh a minute, where he is um, he is invited to the house of a judge who's trying to convince him to reject alcohol and embrace a new way of living, and he pretend, Huck's father pretends like he's converted only to wreak havoc on the judge's house, and it's all quite amusing and entertaining 
even while you never forget how, well, how cruel this man actually is. It's the kind of ambivalence you will also find later on in the novel with the characters of the Duke and the King, both of whom are, again, uh, can be quite fun. Uh, their adventures and their exploits are, are quite fun to read about, but who are also utterly and terribly cruel and, and evil. At the same time, one of the things that I believe make Huckleberry Finn a, gr a, a truly great novel and makes it outstanding in its portrayal of this this way of living and its portrayal of Huck's mind as he grows up beyond the realm of childhood play and explores the full freedom of being on his own is the fact that this isn't in it isn't a sentimental novel except maybe for one or two moments of weakness. The sense you get from the narrative is not that Huck is a uh, an innocent child that would just like to be a good boy um, and live with the widow who's trying to make a decent person out of him, but unfortunately the um, his father leads him into you know perdition and crime. Ark is actually pretty happy when his father takes him away from the widow because he can just laze about all day and he doesn't have to study or or pretend like he's something he is not. Huck's independent spirit and his attitude to life is what makes him a truly great literary character and a human archetype in the same vein as people like Hamlet or Ahab or Jane Eyre. And I, it, it, that's what makes, of course, it's what makes his adventure so compelling, even while the novel gives you plenty of chances to despise him. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Of course, the action in the novel takes off after Huck's stages, he is, well, something happening in the in the log cabin where he lives with his father, won't give away the plot, and he goes away and he joins with Jim, uh, an escaped slave, who, and, and they start their adventures down the Mississippi on their raft and canoe. For 300 pages, Huckleberry Finn becomes a picaresque novel, people with exciting adventures, with engaging episodes, with lots of comedy, and with a few moments of wisdom that put me in mind of those scenes in Shakespeare where fools and jesters turn out to be the wisest people and the, the, the ones with the most sage advice in difficult situations. Lots of comedy, as I said, but also lots of danger. Usually the atmosphere remains lighthearted and idyllic so long as Jim and Huck are by themselves. But as soon as somebody else gets into the picture, say as soon as they reach a town along the Mississippi, as soon as they team up with somebody else, a certain element of danger creeps in, which is made all the more terrible by the fact that as a child at and as an African-American in the South, they are both at danger, they are both at the mercy of the white people who rule these places, rule this, this land and who are showed in all their cruelty and ruthlessness. The king, the duke, Huck's father, sure, they are, they are vaudeville villains in a, in a way, they are almost comic in, in their wickedness, but truly all of the other characters that people don't know, well, at least all of the character, most of the characters Huck and Jim meet down the Mississippi, also exhibit that same type of Viol of, of commitment to violence, of uh, bigotry, of terrible spite, without even, the, uh, without even the excuse of being somewhat funny in the mix. Probably the strongest passage in the whole novel is the end of the so-called feud section, where Huck has been living with a family for a while, and he becomes involved in a, again in a feud with a different family, and there's a description of a terrible act perpetrated against some young people uh, in the course of the violence between these two families. That is one of the most, the strongest, the most bleak indictment of human violence I've ever read. It's, it's up there with certain passages in, in Cormac McCarthy's Blood Meridian. I have touched upon the danger that Jim faces as an African-American in the American South, in the Southern United States, at a time where slavery was still the rule in the States. And obviously, it's impossible to read Huckleberry Finn these days without confronting that element, without confronting 
the systematic and ingrained racism that is clear and blatant all across this novel, and that in a way might even rule the way the novel is built. Michael Chabon famously, well, famously, maybe not famously, but he wrote an essay about reading Huckleberry Finn to his kids and about his difficulties with the novel because the N-word is used all over the place in this novel. And what do you do when you read a novel like this to your kids? Do you, do you well, censor it? Do you try and explain the situation to them? And I haven't read the essay, I haven't reread it in a while, but I believe that he kind of doesn't really get to a solution to that dilemma, because I don't think there is a solution. I don't think you can explain away the racism of Huckleberry Finn by just by saying, oh, well, but Mark Twain was sympathetic with the plight of African Americans, or with simply saying, yeah, we should stop reading it at all. I don't, I don't really think that is a solution. Just as much as, for all that Jim is one of the great, is one of the great characters in American literature, I do believe it's clear that some racism went into the way he was built and portrayed too, of course. Um, for all, Twain wasn't that enlightened as it would be nice to assume he was. To put it very simply and to try and extrapolate something we can do uh, rather than just admitting how complicated everything is, I believe that these days we can and I think we should read Huckleberry Finn as a testimony of the way racism and 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 race relations are ingrained in the mentality of the United States and especially the Southern United States, which by the way is a, a central topic in some great works of literature I've read recently, most notably uh, The Nickel Boys by Colson Whitehead, which I cannot recommend highly enough. At one point um, Huck is asked, asked, or somebody in the novel is asked about an explosion on a steamboat, and the person who's, who's asking the question says, uh, did somebody die in this explosion? And the reply is, an African-American lost his life. And the person who asks goes, oh, well, that's good. Sometimes people get hurt in these things. And the obvious implication there is that African-Americans are not just seen as inferior in this mentality. They are not regarded as people at all. And the full monstrousness of this is hard to comprehend, but Huckleberry Finn gives you a pretty clear idea of how that works. I said before, I talked before about the feud scene, but I changed my mind. The actual most horrible scene in the entire novel is the passage, and of course I'm going to spoil you a bit of the plot here. Um, if, if you don't want that, come back to this review after you've read the book. The most horrifying passage of the book happens about halfway through when Huck suddenly realizes that he's been helping uh, Jim to escape from his supposed owner, so he's been helping an, uh, a fugitive slave, and he suddenly realizes that that's possibly bad and that he shouldn't be doing that because that's breaking the law. And by this point, the two of them have already lived through quite a few adventures. They've been traveling together for a while. The idea is that they're friends. And even so, Huck still thinks that maybe it would be better and it would be you know, it would be the right thing to just uh, report Jim to the authorities so that he can be punished for trying to acquire his freedom. And the full horror of this, again, is hard to comprehend, but we need to understand what th these kinds of mentalities and the perversion of this mentality if we are to truly move beyond the horrors of the past and face a more just society without just pretending that these problems went away, because clearly as the word the world always shows us they kind of haven't at all. Don't get me wrong, I do believe that the relationship and the friendship between Jim and Huck is one of the warmest and one of the most endearing I've read in, in a very long time, but it does require you a pretty complex exercise in approaching this narration on the one hand, by understanding the experience and the mentality of the character that is giving you the narration, and on the other, on the other hand, without, without having this, this process simply coincide with accepting whatever he says and with excusing some of the horrible things he is led to think, do, commit, etc. It is a complicated process. It's the reason why, as I mentioned before, literature very rarely offers itself to us to, to straightforward answers of the sort of. 
you know, oh, it, it was just the con it was just the historical context, so let's just excuse everything we read, or vice versa, the opposite position of let's stop reading the stuff in the first place. It can help us face these issues better, it can help us get to the heart of these horrible matters, but it requires dedication and it requires a high level of emotional intelligence. Thankfully enough, emotional intelligence and the capacity to relate to other people and their plight is exactly what literature fosters in its readers. And then the novel gets to the Phelps farm and the final few chapters. Those last few chapters have been puzzling readers since forever. Hemingway, for all that, as I said, was a huge fan of the book, thought they were rather pointless. I'm with T.S. Eliot and other readers in believing that at least they bring the narrative full circle and they, they take you back to the same atmosphere and attitude of the first few chapters. Tom Sawyer returns uh, on the scene. But while I understand why they were there and while I understand that the novel, at the end of the day, couldn't possibly really end any other way, man, are they annoying and man, do they drag along for, 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 for too long. And also the effect of uh, Tom Sawyer coming back and acting the way he does in his final few chapters. It's like when you, it's like when you get to, I don't know, 16, 18, and you meet somebody who was a big friend of yours in middle school. You meet him again. And, he, and you loved his jokes and you thought he was a blast when you were 12, but then all of a sudden you realize he was quite obnoxious all along. And that's the effect of meeting Tom Sawyer again at the end of Huckleberry Finn. It is a very interesting return, that of the narrative to the same childish play of the first few chapters. And the thing, one of the things that fascinates me a lot about um, Huckleberry Finn. Uh, I've remarked in the past that I'm I'm fascinated with narratives of escapism, with this process of escaping real life commitments, traumas into imagination. Is that in Tom Sawyer the opposite happens? Usually with these novels, you have characters in difficult situations who escape into their imagination, but in the end have to face the fact that they must confront their problems and come back to the commitments of real life. In Huckleberry Finn, you actually have Huck at the beginning of the book, being trapped in this boring, pointless, childish, childish games, escaping with Jim to face real life on the Mississippi, but then in the end of the novel having to go back to that imaginary world of civilization and propriety and, and, and games. It's a bizarre anti-escapist dynamic, but I found it truly fascinating and, and compelling. I greatly appreciated Huckleberry Finn. I look forward to hearing what you guys thought of the novel, how you read it. Is this a work you read as adolescents, as kids, or did you read it in your adulthood? Did it change upon rereading? I really look forward to discussing the novel with you.